this is Professor Rivera Mitu, and today we will be talking about the different types of anemia. So we know that the uh, stem cell can become any cell, right? And then um, here we're going to talk about it in the context of it becoming a myeloid cell or a lymphoid cell. And then the myeloid cell becomes a myeloblast. This becomes a lymphoblast. And from here, sorry, this becomes a lymphocyte. And from being a lymphocyte, we're gonna finish this one up because we're gonna uh, spend a lot of time on the myeloblast. So the lymphocyte, the lymphocyte becomes a natural killer cell. And then here, it also becomes a small lymphocyte. And the small lymphocytes are your, your uh, uh, T and your B. I'm gonna erase this last one here. And then that, first the B cells become your um, plasma cells. And then when they're activated becomes your uh, memory cells and then becomes your immunoglobulin antibody. The T cells, um, there's two main kinds also. So we already talked about the natural killer T cells. And then there's also the helper cells. And that's your CD4, which is what's affected in, in AIDS. And then your suppressor cells, which is what kind of balance that out. T cells are... Um, they fight against um, cancer cells and viral infection. Now we'll um, spend a lot of time on the myeloblasts. So the myeloblasts um, are basically all of the cells that grow in the bone marrow. And um, those could be um, erythroblasts, which becomes your erythrocytes. Then um, your prokaryocytes, those become your um, neutrophils, your eosinophils, and your basophils. You also have your um, megakaryocytes, and that becomes your platelets, so thrombocytes, and your monocytes, which become your macrophages at the site of the um, where it's protecting. So all of these um, come from the bone marrow. Um, so when you, I believe you've already talked about cancer. So these, this is where, um, all of the cells are affected, um, with chemotherapy, but today we're going to focus on, um, the erythrocytes and we're going to talk about the different, uh, anemias that affect the erythrocytes. So before I talk about that, I also want to talk about the different, um, labs that are involved in the CBC that tells you about the anemia. So when we talk about erythrocytes, these are your RBCs, right? And RBC uh, usually is about four to six. In the RBC, we have the hemoglobin, uh, 14 to 16. Well, 16, not... 14 to 16. And so then um, the RBC is contained also 
in the um, whole blood. So RBC in whole blood, that ratio of the RBC, that's your hematocrit. So in your um, CBC, there's also a couple of um, values that we look at when we're looking at anemia. And those are uh, one of them, and actually should have put it here. So let's add that here. Um, here we have the erythrocytes. So become, before it becomes an erythrocyte, the cell, it first is a reticulocyte. Okay, so a reticulocyte is a baby or immature erythrocyte. Okay, and this should only be about 1% of your um, erythrocytes unless there is a blood loss or a hypoxia, chronic hypoxia that's happening to the patient. Um, then the body will compensate by producing more uh, RBCs. And so you're going to see a lot more reticulocytes at that time. Okay, so this is the RBC. Uh, and then we also look at the um, size and the, sh the shade of the RBC in, the, in your CBC. So we look at that as, uh, let me see where I'm going to put it. I'll put it here in this corner here for now. That is your MCV. CV means your um, mean corpuscular uh, volume. This is looking at is the size of your red blood cell. So when we're uh, categorizing the MCV, if it's within normal value, then that means that this, the cell is normal acidic means there was nothing wrong with the way that it was formed um, or was developed. Or if the value is too high, then we're going to say that this cell is macrocytic. In your, um, the, in your lesson, a macrocytic cell is the same as your megaloblastic. It could be a low value, and that means that the cell is microcytic. It's too small. So when it's um, either macrocytic or, or microcytic, these two, that means that there's a anemia involved um, that involved development of the RBC. There was something wrong from the get-go from the time that the RBC was made. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And then there's also the MCHC. That means your mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So this has to do with the um the shade, I call it, or the chromacity, chrome. How deep is this red? And so when we pertain to MCHC, um, we either say that this is a normal type of shade, so that's a norm chromic uh, cell, or it's a hypochromic cell, which means that it's pale. And typically, your microcytic um, cells, your microcytic uh, RBCs, are the ones that are also hypochromic. Okay, so um, this will all make sense in a minute. Just track with me for a sec. Um, so these matches the microcytic. Okay, so now let's talk about the different types of anemia um, and how we use these values here in categorizing those types of anemia. So I'm going to put that... Let's start right here, and I'll come back to those in a minute. So uh, one category of anemia is your nutritional anemias. That means that there's a nutrition that is missing from the production of the red blood cell, right? So what are these nutrition that could be missing? It could be iron, or it could be folate, or it could be vitamin B, 12. Um, I'm gonna give you some words that I'd like for you to associate with these particular type of um, anemias, you know, when in deciding that you see them in your exams or just in general. So the iron deficiency anemia, um, as you know, iron is actually what creates that chromacity, that redness in the RBC. And that's why um, if a cell is microcytic, 
it's actually possibly a um, iron deficiency anemia. So let's list a characteristic of something that is iron deficient. So these are the keywords. This is a microcytic um, hypochromic pale anemia. Now, because this patient is gonna be lacking this nutrient, uh, this, this mineral, um, their brain tells them that um, they need this nutrient. And so typically they'll have um, some pica. So as your note says, you know, it could be eating um, ice chips, usually for pregnant women, or it could be eating powder, detergent, paint chips, anything like that, that their brain might think has iron. And so their brain is craving for it. And that's why they um, manifest pica. Now, because they're missing iron from their diet, um, it's going to manifest as some inflammation or some um, underdevelopment in their body. So uh, one thing that you'll see is an inflammation um, in the like corner of their mouth. So that's called chylosis, um, or if it's inflamed, chylitis, chylosis. So these corners here that um, become cracked and inflamed, that's chylosis. Okay, and then if you look at their nails, they're gonna have um, brittle nails or um, spoon shaped. Those are characteristics that are um, specific to iron. And then with folate deficiency, there really is no um, specific uh, presentation except it's just general signs of anemia, which we will discuss um, in when we talk about the like, general signs later on. So general signs and symptoms of anemia. With vitamin B, however, so vitamin B is necessary in neurotransmission among other things. And so when there's vi vitamin B deficiency, okay, uh, one of the complaints of the patient might be paresthesia. So this is also very specific to vitamin B because this is the only one among the nutrition here that is most involved in neurotransmission. So paresthesia, which is numbness and tingling of the um, extremities. Now, if it becomes so severe, um, deficiency, then now there is anemia, right? And so that is your pernicious anemia. Um, this happens when there is such a lack of vitamin B12, um, typically due to an absorption problem. So let's talk about the cause for a second um, before we go to the signs and symptoms. So vitamin B12 um, is absorbed in the, in, in the stomach, right? In the intrinsic factor. So when there is a uh, decrease factor, we'll just say decrease absorption and this of the stomach, then that causes um, the deficiency. Now, what causes decreased absorption of um, vitamin B in the stomach? Typically, it's due to the decrease of intrinsic, fa intrinsic factor, which is in the gut, I mean, in the um, stomach. So where, when is intrinsic factor um, uh, decreased? So usually when there's some type of inflammation in the stomach, such as gastritis um, or peptic ulcer disease, um, then that uh, damages the intrinsic factor. And so you can't absorb vitamin B. So who are these people who get gastritis a lot? Um, it could be your patient who, um, has acute gastritis, uh, frequent, uh, persistent, let's say persistent acute gastritis. The cause of that, it could be um, they take a lot of NSAIDs. And keep in mind that NSAIDs are prostaglandin inhibitors. That's the class. And prostaglandin is important in protecting the GI mucosa uh, from being irritated. Um, and so if you give an NSAID, that's why we give NSAIDs with food um, because it could damage the stomach, causing irritation, causing inflammation, causing gastritis. And so if someone is taking uh, NSAIDs daily, um, then they can get gastritis um, and they can get a vitamin B deficiency. So another prostaglandin inhibitor is steroid. 
that's how it's anti-inflammatory. And so if think of someone who has autoimmune disease, um, who has to take steroid all the time, like pill steroid, um, or uh, uh, an asthmatic who has to take um, pill steroid all the time. So that could cause gastritis as well. Or your um, elderly who may have um, atro atrophic gastritis, which is uh, dryness um, because of, you know, just their age. Um, and then the other thing, um, kind of alongside with other things that can cause gastritis, um, we'll just say like, uh, you know, lifestyle. So smoking, uh, eating a lot of acidic food, uh, eating a lot of sour food, drinking a lot of soda and alcohol. Alcohol is really big. So these can all cause gastritis, um, which causes uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Very common in alcoholics, actually. And then here, um, your gastric bypass patients, because they literally, in a gastric bypass, they literally bypass the fundus of the stomach. And so then for the rest of their life, they will not have um, vitamin B12 anymore. They're going to have to have a supplement the whole time. So um, how do we know that someone has vitamin B deficiency um, along with um, the challenge that they will that they will do as far as um, checking for deficiency? We want to look at some signs and symptoms. Um, and again, paresthesia is a sign of vitamin B12 deficiency. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's anemia yet, but if there is anemia, then for sure there will be paresthesia because that comes before even the pernicious anemia. So in this patient, um, some words that you want to associate uh, with this anemia, again, along with paresthesia, is a beefy red tongue. That is because of glossitis that happens when there's lack of vitamin B. Okay, so... Um, as far as cause, you know, patients who have um, these these issues at the top or um, beefy red tongue, glossitis, paresthesia, those are the ones for pernicious anemia. And then um, you guys also, I think, talk about um, briefly, or at least from what I've seen, about uh, genetic anemias. So genetic anemias, I'm going to focus on a couple, but um, I'm going to go ahead and list them um, all here. So obviously with genetic anemias, um, there's something that is wrong with the way that the RBC was made because there's a gene that is defective, right? That they acquired from a immediate family member. And oftentimes because there's a defect um, in the cell, your genetic anem anemias also become your hemolytic anemias. Okay, because the body will reject the cell, the RBC that is abnormal, and so it destroys it. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about sickle cell. Um, so genetic anemias, um, let's enumerate some of them. So uh, sickle cell, um, thalassemia. Thalassemia. And thalassemia can be, uh, generally speaking, minor or major depending on which um, chain is defective, um, either the alpha or the beta chain. Uh, minor is alpha, major is beta. Um, major you don't see a lot because uh, these people, um, usually the babies would get this um, and then they'll they'll have hemolysis and a lot of them will, will die in the womb um, due to anemia from hemolysis. Um, unless, you know, that's caught during prenatal care and they get a transfusion in, in utero. So that's one. And then um, we also have um, G6PD anemia and um, siderosis. So let's talk about um, sickle cell. But before I do that, I want to go back to the normous, the microcytic anemias here. So for microcytic, I use that. This is just informational. I use the acronym tickles. So tickles mean that all of these anemias that I'm going to list here will present as a microcytic anemia. So when you look at the RBC, the CBC, you're going to see that the MCV is low. So thalassemia, iron deficiency anemia, 
anemia of chronic disease. So what is chronic disease? Anyone who um, have COPD or kidney disease or some kind of musculoskeletal neuromuscular disease um, may have a microcytic anemia. L is for lead poisoning. So the uh, kids um, by two years old are screened for lead poisoning, especially, I, I think that that's a standard now, but especially, you know, those who live in um, old apartment buildings um, that may have lead paint because sometimes kid, kids eat the paint, um, you know, and it could be from iron deficiency as well for pica, um, but that could present as a microcytic anemia. Siderosis, again, hemosiderosis. So we've talked about nutritional anemia, we've talked about genetic anemia, and thalassemia, thalassemia minor um, doesn't have a specific presentation. Um, they kind of present, uh, again, the same with general signs of anemia. I want you to remember that there's actually two different paths to um, the type of anemia that the patient may have. Um, so it could be that there's... Oops, um, volume loss, right? Which is your hypovolemia. That could be from a uh, surgery, trauma. Um, in the uh, females, it could be menorrhagia. It could be metrorrhagia, bleeding excessively uh, in between menses. Okay, so these are more acute things that happen, okay? So when there's hypovolemia, um, what we'll see as the characteristic of the cell is that, of course, we're gonna see low RBC, right? Because they lost blood, which means they're also gonna be low hemoglobin. Um, and because there's low RBC, then there's also, and, and loss of whole blood, there's also gonna be low hematocrit. However, because there's nothing wrong with the way that the uh, RBCs were made, were manufactured, then we know that our MCV and our MCHC will be normal. And so we call this a normocytic, um, normochromic anemia. So, however, because this is a loss of blood, um, so now you're saying because there's loss of blood, then there will be decreased perfusion. Because perfusion by definition is the blood, uh, the flow of oxygenated blood into the tissues, okay? So whenever you hear perfusion, you should be thinking of blood flow, okay? Now that's different from oxygenation. So um, if there's an anemia, um, like the ones that we've talked about earlier, which are your um, nutritional anemias um, or your genetic anemias. So with these, it's not uh, a perfusion problem. There was no blood loss, but there's a decrease in hemoglobin. Maybe a decrease in RBC if there's... um hemolysis involved, but because there's a decrease in hemoglobin primarily, there's a decrease in O2 in the cells, okay? Decrease O2. So technically speaking, these are two different things based on cause um, and also based on um, interventions. But what they both do, even with perfusion, is there will be a lack of oxygen because there's not enough blood that carries um, hemoglobin, so then therefore there will be a lack of oxygen in the cells. And so when there's a lack of oxygen, we want to think about where is there a lack of oxygen so that we can think of the signs and symptoms of anemia in general. I've, I've talked about the specific ones that you want to remember for each kind, and then we'll talk about the general. So in the brain, it could start with um, just some headaches. Um, it could be uh, some irritation. Right, they're, they're irritable, irritability. Um, and then it could become an altered level of consciousness. They become lethargic, they're sleepy um, because of the lack of oxygen. Eventually, if there is such a lack of oxygen, then of course it will lead to ischemia. And um, from ischemia, there could be necrosis of cells, of brain cells. When there's ischemia or necrosis of brain cells, um, these can cause uh, more long-term dementia, 
Okay, that's called the vascular dementia. Um, and um, it can also cause um, a CVA, right? This will be ischemic stroke. I'm not sure if you've talked about stroke yet. So that could be a ischemic stroke. In the heart, um, the coronary arteries will have decreased perfusion. And so that supplies the myocardium. So there will be um, ischemia to the myocardium. Of course, when there's ischemia to the myocardium, then that will cause chest pain, right? Someone can have chest pain. And if it's severe, um, then that can even lead to an MI, a myocardial infarction. In addition, um, because there's a lack of oxygen, the heart will compensate by increasing the heart rate. And so if this patient doesn't get any treatment um, with their anemia, then the heart is gonna be constantly working hard. And so once it's overworked, the muscles, uh, once it's, because it's working hard, the muscles become big, right? And so that's a, let's put the right term there, that will cause hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, usually we're just pertaining to like a ventricle, it's not the whole heart. Or it could lead to the whole heart being enlarged, which is cardiomegaly. Now with um, the heart being enlarged and it's, it's overworked, that could lead to heart failure. In the lungs, because there's lack of oxygen, so obviously this, this patient um, will always feel short of breath, they'll have dyspnea, they can have dyspnea on exertion, meaning whenever they do an activity that requires an, an increase in oxygen demand, um, they will get uh, really short of breath. And of course, to compensate, their respiratory rate will also increase. Um, in the kidneys, due to the lack of um, oxygen, so the nephrons will start to die. And so um, they can get chronic kidney disease. And at stage five of chronic kidney disease, that is called end stage renal disease. This is a GFR um, that is less than 15 mLs per minute. Normal GFR is um, 90 to 120 mLs per minute. This is, this is someone with long-term anemia, and there's other factors here, which I'll discuss again in sickle cell. Um, in addition, so you know that the musculoskeletal, um, the MSK, also needs oxygen. And so um, without oxygen, the muscles are weak. So your patient will have generalized weakness, which is called malay, um, and they will have um, fatigue. So these are the signs and symptoms, general signs and symptoms of um, anemia. Now, in someone who is, has a very low hemoglobin, when we ask, are they symptomatic? These are the symptoms that we're looking for. Um, okay, so that is for your uh, general signs and symptoms. So now um, I'm going to plug in a sickle cell and tell you what the difference is. Uh, in the Basically, this is sickle cell disease, not sickle cell anemia, okay? There's a difference between the two. So let's start with um, sickle cell, the sickle cell gene being in a patient. And so when they have the sickle cell gene, they have a tendency to, uh, um, they, so let's say they're positive for sickle cell gene. And then when they have the sickle cell disease, how we determine sickle cell disease, because they could be a carrier, even though they just, they have the sickle cell gene. But here, when they have the sickle cell disease itself, they will do a hemoglobin electrophoresis and they will find a hemoglobin S. So the hemoglobin S being in um, the blood, this causes the RBC to be frail. Um, it has a, a very low tolerance to oxygen demand. So what happens um, when we place a lot of demand on this patient to, um, let's see, first increased O2 demand. So when there's an increased O2 demand, I'll come back to that and talk about the um, examples of what, how O2 demand is increased. But whenever there's increased oxygen demand, 
um, the RBC that is frail becomes sickled, right? Under the microscope, it kind of looks like that, like a sickle. So before we look at the different um, signs and symptoms, let's look at, well, what, what can cause an increase in oxygen demand? Um, definitely um, illness. So acute illness can cause that, such as infections, Okay, uh, COVID definitely is an acute illness, uh, pneumonia, any type of issue wherein there's a sickness, they're not gonna increase the oxygen demand. Uh, strenuous activities, um, for example, over exercising um, uh, or not getting enough rest, like students who work full-time and having to study or maybe even having kids, that increases the oxygen demand. Um, and then also um, if they live in a high altitude or they go to a high altitude area, like up in the mountains, um, wherein there's a decreased level of oxygen. So that's gonna place more demand um, on their bodies. And so then when the uh, RBCs are sickled, then it could trigger a, a vaso-occlusive crisis. Oops. So, um, let's go to your vaso occlusive crisis, which is the most common. Um, so, what does that mean? Um, when that happens, due to the sickled RBC, there, there's a couple of, of ways that this goes. So, one is um, the sickled RBC is going to get hemolyzed, it's going to go to the spleen and it's gonna go there for hemolysis. So when it's hemolyzed, two things happen. Um, one is um, there it will be a low level of hemoglobin and that is your anemia. And then you will go back to the general signs of anemia and that's what the patient would feel. Um, and I'll add more stuff here in a minute. So the other thing is because of this hemolysis, um, there will be byproduct. So there's gonna be an increase in the RBC waste product. And the product that we are most concerned about um, is your uh, bilirubin, right? There will be an increased bilirubin in the system, which is a waste product of RBC breakdown and so now this bilirubin is gonna to go to the blood. So now your total bilirubin will increase because there will be bilirubinemia. Okay, so in a um, lab that will be in your CMP, you will look for, for the total bilirubin. Um, and then the first thing that's gonna happen um, because there's high bilirubin is the kidney is going to want to excrete that to, to try and maintain balance. Okay. Um, and so you're going to start seeing bilirubinuria. So if you do a UA, you're going to see uh, bilirubin po is positive. Also, when you look at the patient's urine, you're going to see what's called a Coca-Cola urine. It's very dark, very brown. And that's because of the increased pigmentation due to the bilirubin. Now the kidney can only do so much at a given time frame, and so it's not going to be able to keep up with the um, getting rid of all the bilirubin. And so this is also going to seep out um, into the eyes and into the skin. So in the eyes, this is where we see that icteric sclera meaning yellow eyes. And in the skin, um, we are going to see jaundice. And then we're also gonna see a dry and rough skin because of the bilirubin kind of seeping out and that will cause um, pruritus. So this patient is gonna be very itchy because of the bilirubin that's seeping out of the skin. So then um, 
because the spleen is is working very hard to um destroy all of these abnormal rbcs so then on um, the spleen is going to get overworked and kind of like what happened to the heart when it's overworked it's going to get enlarged so there will there could be splenomegaly and if um we don't treat this patient then the spleen continues to work hard and then that could cause splenic rupture when there's splenic rupture, that's uh, it means that there will be irritation in the peritoneal cavity. And so that could lead to peritonitis, which could also lead to um, sepsis, okay, which could lead to septic shock and uh, septic shock, multi organ. Um, uh, I forget what it is, deficiency syndrome, and then death. Okay, this is a um, someone who's not treated at all. Um, and then um, because of the low hemoglobin, so let's go back to that and look at the other signs and symptoms in addition to the ones that we've already talked about there. Um, actually, I'm gonna go another route here just so we have more space. So the sickle cell, the other thing that happens to it um, apart from the hemolysis, is um, it starts to clog the circulation, right? Because um, it's sickled. It, it, it's not biconcave like a normal RBC. And so because it's not biconcave like a normal RBC, it can't get through the microvasculature. And so when it gets to the microvasculature, it gets stuck. Okay, so... Um, that is part of that vaso-occlusive crisis, that occlusion, okay? So that's the occlusion part. So when there's an occlusion, let's think about where that occlusion might be. Um, again, it could be in the brain. Um, oops, actually, let me first say that there will be, in general, an uh, ischemia because of the occlusion. Now, whenever there's ischemia into the cells, um, it causes an increase in inflammatory mediators. Okay. And so whenever there's an increase in inflammatory mediators, um, if it's an organ that has um, uh, uh, nerves, then the patient is going to feel pain. So in this, in this patient, we're talking about the musculoskeletal system. And um, so this patient is going to be in a lot of pain because of the ischemia and the inflammation that happens there. Uh, and again, as far as the ischemia to other body parts, um, it could be to the brain. Um, this can happen to the lungs. And I know I put MSK here, but I'm going to specifically also say the sternum, which is a cartilage, um, because there could be inflammation there as well. And then, of course, the heart and the kidneys, like we mentioned earlier. So um, put the kidneys over here. Okay. So what happens to... The brain, um, similar to the ones that we've talked about for general signs of anemia, um, when there's lack of uh, blood flow, this time blood flow, because it's the, uh, the uh, clotting, the occlusion of the blood vessels. And so this can lead to altered level of consciousness, again, which could lead to a TIA or a CVA, okay? Um, because of the inflammation, it may even lead to encephalopathy, um, also due to the increase in the bilirubin. Okay, so this right here, along with the inflammation, can lead to encephalopathy. And when someone has encephalopathy, that can lead to seizures. So, a lot of 
that can lead to seizures, can lead to coma, can lead mm -hmm. to death. There's also going to be cognitive deficits. And it could lead to functional deficits. And, and some of this can be permanent. Functional deficits as in their ability to, um, to move and to do their ADLs. Cognitive deficit as in, again, the dementia or um, decreased cognition. Um, usually this is assessed through your minimental status exam. Um, so those are the things that could happen in the brain. In the lung, in the heart, sorry. Again, um, there could be um, a decreased uh, uh, coronary perfusion. And because of the decreased coronary perfusion, um, the patient can get a myocardial infarction. Um, and from there can also get uh, dysrhythmia, which could be a deadly dys dysrhythmia such as ventricular fibrillation. Um, in addition to that, again, there's going to be increased heart rate. Um, that can also lead to a dysrhythmia. In the lungs, um, there will be increased um, because of the the lack of um, of the occlusion of the circulation. There will be pulmonary congestion, and so what happens is the blood um, from the pulmonary capillaries will shift to the alveoli. from the blood vessels, from the pulmonary capillaries. And so once it's in the alveoli, there's gonna be a decrease in O2. So we're gonna start seeing hypoxia in our ABGs. And that would be um, a less than 80 PaO2. Okay. Eventually, um, as the congestion uh, continues to increase, um, then there will be an increase in um, CO2 retention. So how do we know in our ABG, we're gonna see a PCO2 that is greater than 45. And um, the other thing that is happening is because there is blood in the alveoli, so we are going to hear some rails, which is the same as coarse crackles. And this patient may also have frothy pink tinged sputum. And if that happens, we know that there is blood for sure in the alveoli and the patient is trying to get rid of it by coughing it out. It's frothy because of the patient's increased respiration that causes bubbles um, in the secretion. Now, the other congestion that happens is not just to the lungs, but also to the sternum. Um, and then when this happens, there's inflammation because of the ischemia. And so when there's inflammation um, in the sternum, again, there's going to be chest pain. Um, and these are called acute chest syndrome. Okay, which, which is something that happens in uh, sickle cell. In the kidneys, just like with any um, uh, lack of circulation, uh, and remember this is happening acutely, um, so then the, the kidneys are going to start to fail, so the patient can have an acute kidney injury. And how do we know that someone has an acute kidney injury? One, we look at the output and the output, the urinary output will decrease. How decrease should be less than 30 ml per hour times at least two consecutive hours. So if you're given a patient that has an output for let's say an eight hour shift, you would wanna uh, like a total, let's say I'm a 480 or something like that, you would wanna divide that number by eight so that you can see if the hourly output is greater than or less than 30 ml per hour. Now in our labs, which is even more important, we wanna look at the serum creatinine. So the, this is the um, definitive um, sign of acute kidney injury. So your serum creatinine, which is in your CMP will increase. 
Okay, and typically uh, the high end is 1.2, so it will be greater than 1.2. As we look at that, then we're also looking at the GFR, and again, the GFR will decrease. Um, but uh, that is second only to looking at the serum creatinine. And of course, if there's um, a lot of serum creatinine, um, then um, the higher that is, then that could also cause some uremic syndrome. And that's a toxin again that could affect the brain. In addition to that, um, the higher the serum creatinine and the lower the GFR, the higher the chances that electrolyte imbalance will happen. And so we might be looking at hyperkalemia um, when the body is not able to excrete all that. Um, so that's another thing that we would need to address in sickle cell. Um, so now let's talk about um, interventions for this patient who has sickle cell. So let's start with, oh, uh, oh yeah. So let's start with prevention. Um, so here, in order to uh, prevent any acute illnesses, um, universal precautions is important. Um, so we'll put that universal precautions. All right, hand washing, sanitizing. Um, in addition to that, uh, vaccines, such as uh, making sure that they have the booster for Tdap, making sure that they have the most updated COVID-19 vaccine, the um, recent flu vaccine, and um, maybe even a pneumonia vaccine. Okay. They have to have adequate rest. So at least um, six to eight hours of sleep per night. Um, it's also very important to um, uh, increase the fluids. It doesn't really quite affect it here, but when they have a vaso-occlusive crisis, we want to prevent that um, the uh, occlusion, okay? And so as another um, precaution, so as far as precaution medication-wise, they're gonna get an aspirin. And again, typically that's to prevent um, a vaso-occlusive crisis by um, making sure that the platelets don't clump and our aspirin is a platelet aggregation inhibitor. And so um, that will prevent clots. As far as the um, sickled RBC, the medication that the patient should get for that is hydroxyurea. And what dehydroxyurea would, so this is a technically uh, like a chemo drug, it's a cytotoxic drug, hydroxyurea. And what it's gonna do is destroy the sickled RBC um, before it causes any damage. Um, and then that way, you know, the and the, the patient doesn't um, get the vaso-occlusive crisis. Obviously, when they are already in a vaso-occlusive crisis, we want to make sure that we give them enough um, fluids. So IV fluids is very important, or uh, at least increase the hydration. When they're at this point um, where the sickle RBC is clogging the circulation, they're likely going to also get an anticoagulant that is stronger than aspirin because aspirin is not an anticoagulant. It is an antiplatelet. So they're likely going to get an anticoagulant. Um, if this is inpatient, this is likely going to be heparin. Or it could be one of the new um, direct acting anticoagulants like uh, Eliquis or uh, Prodaxa. So these are the examples. Heparin usually is either sub-Q or a drip, an IV drip, depending on how um, high the, uh, sorry, how low the INR is or how high the platelets are. So heparin, um, direct acting anticoagulant. Um, okay. If it's not that severe, maybe Lovenox, which is a low molecular weight heparin. 
uh, and then um, for the regular signs of uh, anemia, we know that we're going to give this patient some oxygen for their hypoxia. Put it here. So O2, definitely. Um, if this gets worse, they might need to be intubated, ventilated. If the PCO2 continues to increase, here we're going to do some TCTB, turn, cough, deep breathe, to get rid of that extra um, secretion that's there, and also to prevent pneumonia. Um, for hyperkalemia, if there is hyperkalemia, um, this patient may get... Um, First of all, uh, insulin, and this is regular insulin, um, IV, and when we're giving insulin, there's always two medications that's added to it to prevent the um, iatrogenic effect of giving insulin IV. One is D50 um, to prevent hypoglycemia, and then the other one is calcium gluconate to prevent hypocalcemia. These are all given at the same time. Um, if um, the kidneys are not completely shot, then we can still give a loop diuretic to try and remove the potassium through the kidneys by um, urinating it out. Or um, through the GI, we can also give coexalate, which is a potassium binding um, medication that causes, uh, it's, it's a laxative. Um, but it's potassium binding, okay. Respiratory wise, we can also give albuterol because albuterol is a beta adrenergic uh, medication, agonist albuterol. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna shift the blood, the shift the potassium from the blood to the cell back to where it belongs and decreasing potassium in the blood. So this is true for any hyperkalemia, okay? Not just not just here. Um, obviously we're gonna monitor the output up here. We might need to insert a Foley catheter if the patient is lethargic um, or just monitor the output. Well, we'll say I you know, okay. Um, if um, usually there will be inflammation and so WBC is probably gonna be increased here. Um, and that means that the patient's likely gonna get some antibiotic as well or some steroid um, as an anti-inflammatory. Okay. <clears throat> For the inflammation in general. For the pain, which is one of the classic presentation of uh, vaso-occlusive crisis of sickle cell. This is an extreme amount of pain. Um, and so typically opioid analgesics are given. So opioids, um, they can get NSAIDs as well. And usually if they're outpatient, they will get NSAIDs, um, but NSAIDs should be given with food or with um, a PPI or an H2 blocker to make sure that there's no um, uh, irritation of the, uh, the stomach. And then, of course, you can start with your non-pharmacological um, as well, massage, guided imagery. Um, uh, it could be something topical like um, diclofenac, which is also an NSAID, or uh, lidocaine, which is an anesthetic into like the extremities or the joints. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? And then for the pruritus, um, you want to <clears throat> give this patient an emollient. <clears throat> so a lotion that will decrease the pruritus, that way they don't get any skin injuries and um, cause more infection. Um, there's nothing much that you could do for the Coca-Cola urine, again, except to increase the fluids. Uh, and if this is a really low hemoglobin, then of course we can do a blood transfusion. Usually when it's um, less than seven or eight, 
depending on the, the facility's policy and how symptomatic is the patient, then they're going to give a blood transfusion um, of packed RBC. So for this patient, it's packed RBC. Um, for the patient who's hypovolemic, it may be not just RBC. So going back here, right, because this patient is losing all their blood. So um, they might get, instead of a uh, packed RBC, they might get whole blood. So again, if this is seven or eight plus symptoms. Um, if they're hypovolemic, one of the first thing that happens is their heart rate increases and their blood pressure decreases. So when that happens, um, let's put that here actually as a sign. Um, vasodilation happens. That's a compensation of the blood vessels. And so that can cause um, uh, syncope because of lack of blood flow to the brain. <clears throat> okay, syncope is fainting, but a different kind of fainting. This is due to lack of blood flow. And so um, we can put this patient on a shock position. Um, sorry, let's put here that there's also, there's vasodilation, there's low blood pressure. Uh, we're concerned when it's less than 90 systolic okay, or less than 90 over 60 uh, if the baseline of the patient is in the 120s. So in this situation, we are also apart from fluids, so IV fluids, to fill in the, um, the wall of the, um, the artery and the veins and cause the blood pressure to increase. But also we can put this patient on a Trendelenburg position, which is the shock position. which is with the head lower than the rest of the body. And what that does is it shunts the blood that is left to the brain, the heart, the lungs, um, all of the important organs to preserve life. I think these are pretty much your anemias.